And lastly, another big keyword that has to do with macroevolution is going to be adaptive radiation. Okay, so radiation, think radiate to spread, right? Like if you have radiation coming off of something, basically shooting off some sort of ray at you. Um, but to radiate, like the sun radiates, uh, we have a lot of different things coming out of one central point. Okay, so adaptive radiation is having a lot of different things come off of one central species due to adaptations that uh, usually have to do with some sort of environment. So I brought back the good old Galapagos finches because why not? That's a great example of different speciation from a common ancestor. Um, and you can see basically all of these things have just, all of these different species have sprung up from a common ancestor based on different environments. Um, and so the same could be true with the lizard example that I showed you, or if you look through that HHMI example, they'll tell you a little bit more about adaptive radiation. Okay, but anytime you see many different species coming out of a parental species, usually because of a um, diverse change in habitat, that's going to be an example of adaptive radiation. Another big topic that I wanted to talk about tonight that I mentioned at the very, very beginning of our podcast is um, phylogenetic trees. Okay, so wow, we've talked about all these different ways that we can get new species, how we prevent species that are separate from mating, um, and that adaptive radiation business where we get lots of different species just from one common ancestor. Um, but the way that we can actually visualize this, which is really, really important, and it shows up on the AP exam all the time. So as I mentioned in the very beginning, super, super important to realize that what this is showing is um, how basically how recently these two species came from a common ancestor. Okay, so if you look all the way to the left of the page, you see something called amniotes. Okay, and we have a rooster or some sort of chicken and a mouse, and they have the most recent connecting branch to one another. Okay, so if you look at where they intersect, that intersection point, it is all the way, it's the top, it's the closest intersection point to the top of the paper. Okay, that means that they have, if this is like a continuum of time, that means that they have the most recent common ancestor, so they are most closely related to one another. Okay, if you look over to where it says teleosis, however the heck you say that, and you see those two fish that also look pretty closely related based on their arch. They are, they definitely have a most recent common ancestor as well. You can see where the arrow is pointing to WGD, okay? Definitely also have a, mo a more common, recent common ancestor, right? But their intersection point is just a little bit further back in time than that of the amniotes. And I can tell that because it's further down the page, okay? Sometimes these will be oriented so that it's like left to right instead of top to bottom like it is now. Um, but just know that however close your intersection point is to the edge, that's going to show how recently that common ancestor was and how commonly those species interact. Okay, okay. so this is an actual AP question. So we're going to take a gander at this. But it says, using the following data, use the following data table to construct a cladogram or phylogenetic tree. Okay. First thing you want to look at anytime you see data points is the title, right? I know, earth shattering, okay? But the title here says the number of amino acid differences in cytochrome C amongst five species. Okay, so if we're looking for how commonly related species are, uh, we are going to look at a lot of different things. We can look at something called morpho morphology or morphological data. That's how something looks. Or we can look at uh, amino acid or DNA data, um, which is obviously going to be something that requires testing. And so, so anytime that we can use amino acids or DNA data uh, is going to be better, right? Because it's just more accurate than just looking at how something looks, right? Because those can be deceiving. Um, and that can also be caused by like convergent evolution or something like that, right? So as Sue pointed out, there's a bunch of zeros running through this table. That should make sense. So sometimes students get confused when they see this table um, because you have to look at kind of simultaneously the rows and the columns, right? And what I mean by that, I can show you an example. If you look at D polylepis, okay, if you look down the column for D polylepis, you'll notice that all you see is 21 and zero, right? So that means D polylepis and E ferris, if you look to the left where that 21 is, okay? E poly, D polylepis and E ferris have 21 differences between them. That's a lot of differences, okay? Next is zero. The zeros exist because it's between D polylepis and D polylepis. It's the same species. They should have zero differences. 
right? And then you might be deceived to think, oh, okay, well, that's it for D. polylepis. But that's not the case, right? The rest of the data is just hidden in the D. polylepis row instead of the column. Okay, so if you look at the D. polylepis row and you follow it over to the right, you'll see that D. polylepis has 18 amino acid differences with G. gallus, 17 differences with A. forsteri, and 20 differences with E. africanus. Okay, so you just kind of have to look in two places at once to get a coherent look at the data. Okay, here's my rule of thumb though. This is a real easy trick for these. So one, you're looking at the title and you notice that these are amino acid differences. Sometimes they will make these charts based on similarities. Then you would get the opposite results, right? Because you want lots of similarities in order to show closely relatedness, okay? But in this case, we're looking at differences. So the smaller the number, the more closely related, okay? Hence the zeros. So what I always tell my students to do is to look for the highest and the lowest number on the table, besides zero, obviously, because those are the same species. So right off the bat, you should be able to point to 21 and 1, okay? So 21, that is the most differences on the table, okay? And that's between, as we already talked about, D. polylepis and E. ferris. So those two species are the least commonly related of any in the tables. Those two are the least commonly related because they have the highest number of amino acid differences amongst them, okay? On the flip side, E. africanus and E. ferris, if you look all the way in the upper right-hand corner where you see that one, they only have one amino acid difference. They're incredibly similar species. They probably had a most recent common ancestor, and that probably should also make sense because they both have, most likely, the same um, genus name, right? They both have E. dot. So they have the same genus name, they just have different species names. So they're most likely very closely related, okay? So, Right off the bat, I know E. africanus and E. ferris need to be really close together on my phylogenetic tree, and D. polylepis and E. ferris need to be really far apart on my phylogenetic tree. And that is a really, really good place to start from. We can fill in this entire phylogenetic tree pretty much with just the information that you just uh, looked at with our biggest differences and then our best, our most similar organisms, okay? So something that I'm going to try to explain really, really briefly is that with a cladogram or a phylogenetic tree, anytime you see a V point, okay, we can rotate around that axis and it will not change the meaning of the cladogram. Okay, so let me give you an example. All the way on the right of that cladogram that you see at the bottom of this table, there's a V, okay, a little V up in the upper right. So eventually we're gonna put E. africanus and E. ferris there because they're the most closely related, okay? But it does not matter if I put E. africanus on the left or the right of that V, okay? So you have a ton of freedom when you're making these cladograms. It's actually really, really awesome um, because you can rotate around that V and it won't change the meaning of your cladogram. So again, I could put E. africanus on the left or on the right and it would mean the same thing as long as it's on the same V or the same branch, we call that a sister taxon as E. ferris, okay? So knowing that we can put both of those all the way on the right and we can put D. polylepis all the way on the left because you should see a trend. Not only is D. polylepis the least closely related to E. ferris, but it also has the highest number of differences with G. gallus, A. forsteri, and E. africanus if you look at the D. polylepis row. Okay, so that guy's gonna belong in the outlier group all the way to the left. It is the least like the others, okay? Then lastly, in that middle V, I'm gonna put my other two species, and that makes sense not only because they're the last two left, but if you look at A. forsteri and G. gallus, they only have three amino acids different from one another, right? So they're a good fit for my other sister taxon or my other little mini V up there in the middle. Okay. The most important thing just is that you have E. ferris and E. africanus together, G. gallus and A. forsteri together, and that D. polylepis is all on its own. Okay, So you definitely want to pick your outlier first. Um, that's a good rule of thumb. And then you just want to pair other mo more closely related species together and kind of work your way in like that. Okay. All right. So I have that all written now um, on the next slide so that you can see what that looks like. And if you skipped ahead, then you got the answer early, okay? Um, but just some like overall kind of things. Now that we've talked about phylogenetic trees, allopatric, sympatric speciation, um, pre and post zygotic barriers, 
right? It's, it's kind of important to see what that looks like or how you can apply it. Um, so one thought question would be to consider two species that diverged while geographically separated, okay? So they're starting out basically in, in the, the starts of perhaps um, habitat isolation or, or allopatric speciation, but they resumed contact, so they resumed contact before reproductive isolation was complete. So this is kind of what I was talking about. They're going in different directions and, and kind of adapting to their own environments, um, but then they come back together before they're completely reproductively isolated. So they can make babies, okay? Then you can kind of think about what would happen if A, the hybrid offspring survived and reproduced more poorly than the individual species offspring, or B, if the hybrid offspring survived and reproduced as well as offspring from the individual species offspring, okay? And this goes into that idea of, of uh, a couple different things. One would be reproductive isolation, but the other would be um, preventing that gene flow um, and some post-zygotic barriers are going to be talked about here. So in situation A, if the hybrid offspring survived and reproduced more poorly, right, then, then that's more of like a hybrid viability situation or a hybrid fertility situation. That's essentially a post-zygotic barrier. So even though these species can still mate because um, they've, they've found each other before speciation has technically ended, um, they, their offspring are not going to survive very well and therefore those are probably going to just die off and we'll probably see that speciation complete. Uh, even though their reproductive isolation was not complete, okay? In B, uh, if their offspring are surviving just as well as when the individual species are mating, then we are just going to create one giant species again. So speciation will not complete um, just because their gene pools are going to mix and any adaptations that they each individually evolved uh, are going to become each other's adaptations because friendship is sharing and sharing is caring. We'll do one more question um, for the night and then wrap it up. Um, but this is the question from an old AP exam, so kind of nice to see what this might look like in multiple choice. Um, so the appearance of a fertile polyploid individual within a population of diploid organisms, fertile polyploid, remember polyploid means they have more than uh, the right number of chromosomes, within a population of diploid organisms is a possible source of a new species, that's what we were talking about. If this individual is capable of reproducing to form a new population, scientists would consider this to be an example of... You guys should know this because we talked about it as a great way to prevent gene flow in B, sympatric speciation, okay? So that's an example of how they might apply um, some sort of sympatric speciation question for you. And just remember, it's going to be harder um, to get speciation to occur amongst uh, species that are still living or populations that are still living in the same area, okay? So you got to work a little harder for it. All right, so I'm going to leave you guys with that. Um, I know we talked about a lot and we were kind of all over the place, but there is a lot of important vocab and I wanted to make sure that I was able to go over most of that um, in detail with you guys uh, so that you had some good understandings either to rephrase something that you did in class um, or, or pre preview stuff that you're going to learn shortly here, okay? So that's all for tonight.